have you ever heard the one about the man and the woman who were getting ready to retire to Florida? Uh, the husband flew down a couple of mo- weeks ahead of his wife to you know, get everything in order and set up and all that kind of stuff. And, and while he was down there, he sent a postcard back home. Uh, unfortunately, the mailman delivered it to the wrong address, and it wound up in the hands of a widow who had just buried her husband the day before. And the postcard read, to my loving wife, I've just arrived and settled in. I'm looking forward to seeing you next week. (laughs) Hope your journey is as uneventful as mine from your departed husband. P.S. It sure is hot down here. (laughs) I don't think any of us want to receive a postcard like that one. Uh, but, uh, but what if you were to see to receive a letter from heaven? That might be a little bit different, right? Um, imagine, if you would, uh, Jesus writing a letter to our church, you know, to just all of us as a group. You know, maybe Kathy goes out to the mailbox one day and, you know, she pulls out a letter. It's, of course, it's going to have like gilded edges or something like that. And nice, nice, fancy pr- printing that says, you know, like 777 Heavenway, New Jerusalem or something like that is the return address. Um, I wonder what the postage would cost on something like that. Of course, today, Jesus would probably use a, you know, a more contemporary form of correspondence, probably email or, or Facebook or Twitter. I hope he wouldn't use Snapchat. Um, I just, I have a higher opinion of Jesus than that. Um, there's only a handful of people laughing because those are the ones using Snapchat. <laughs> but regardless of the form in which the letter came, what do you suppose he would have to say to our church, to us here at Blooming Grove? Would he compliment us on our evangelistic fervor? You know, as, as Chad was talking about wanting to just share Jesus with other people and bring them to church, would he, he tell us that, you know, we've done such a great job of, of teaching the truth and being committed to sound doctrine and diligent Bible study? Uh, or would he, he praise us for our boundless love that we have toward our neighbors and toward one another? Or would he criticize us for the lack of those very things? If he were to challenge us or command us to do one thing differently, what would it be? And imagine if he were to say something about himself. You know, Jesus telling us a little bit about himself, something personal in this letter. What what would he say? How would he describe himself? Was he would he call himself the you know the Lamb of God who you know died for the sins of the world, or would he describe himself as the the Lion of Judah, you know, ready to to pounce upon his apostate people? For seven small churches off the coast of the Mediterranean Sea in the province of Asia, they didn't have to imagine. Uh, roughly thirty some years after the death and resurrection of Jesus, uh, the Apostle John received this vision from heaven. Jesus himself stood before him in in radiant glory, and he told him in Revelation chapter 1, verse 11, write on a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And John, of course, did as he was instructed, writing down everything that he saw and heard in this vision in what we now know as the book of Revelation. Now, Revelation, and I've talked about in the past, it can be a rather intimidating book. You know, it's, it's full of all this apocalyptic imagery uh, with, you know, seven-headed dragons and bizarre beasts and, and all kinds of different symbolism and things like that. But before John witnessed any of that strange symbolic stuff, Jesus gave John seven brief messages recorded in chapter 2 and 3 of Revelation, which are known as the seven letters to these seven churches. And while it might be a federal offense to open someone else's mail, I don't think anybody would mind at this point if we were to read each one of these letters and see just what Jesus had to say to his churches. Even though our our setting and our circumstances differ wildly from theirs, I think that we'll find we face a lot of the same challenges, the same difficulties and dilemmas. 
And although these were, in fact, real historical churches, I mean, these were real congregations like ours that met in all of these different cities, they, in a lot of ways, symbolize and, and represent congregations all over the world, all throughout history, and many of the pitfalls and problems that, that we've faced as, as a church. So for the next seven weeks, I want to invite you to join me as we explore each of these seven short letters from Jesus to these seven churches and discover what Christ's message was to them and to us. And we're going to start with the letter to the church in Ephesus. Jesus addressed his first letter to the church in Ephesus. And I want to read this together. If you have a Bible uh, or an app on your phone, please open it up to Revelation chapter 2. And, and I like reading this one out of a paper Bible. The words will be up here on the screen as well, but I like reading out of a paper Bible because there's just something about those red letters. Uh, I don't know whose idea it was to put the words of Jesus in red in the Bible, but, but every time you open it up and you see it that way, it adds just a little bit of weight to what you're reading. Uh, at least that's how I feel about it. So I want to read this. This is from the NLT, by the way. Starting in verse 1 of Revelation chapter 2, this is what Jesus says. Write this letter to the angel of the church in Ephesus. This is the message from the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. I know all the things you do. I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know you don't tolerate evil people. You've examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not. You discovered that they are liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. But I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Turn back to me and do the works you did at first. If you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what He's saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give fruit from the tree of life and the paradise of God. Now, even though the content of each of these seven letters is unique to the church that he's writing to, the structure or the pattern is the same in each one. Uh, every time Jesus starts the letter with a picture of himself. You know, he says something about himself, introducing himself in some interesting and colorful way. And, and then after that, he, he gives uh, you know, a compliment or a criticism to the church, praising them for something or condemning them for something. Some, some churches receive both, some just receive one or the other. Uh, and then afterward, he gives them a specific command unique to that church and the problems that they're facing, something that he needs them to do. And so I want to follow Jesus' own outline as we unpack these letters, uh, starting, of course, with the portrait of Christ. How does Jesus portray himself to this church? Well, Jesus gives himself, as I said, a colorful and fantastic description in the first verse, picturing himself in verse 1, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand, the one who walks among the seven gold lampstands. Now, like I said, the book of Revelation is full of colorful fantasy imagery, you know, bizarre images, vivid word pictures, supernatural creatures, cryptic language, etc. And Bible scholars for centuries have argued about the meaning of various symbols. Fortunately for us, Jesus himself actually explains this particular image. He says back in Revelation 1, verse 20, he says, this is the mystery or the meaning of the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven gold lampstands. The seven stars are the messages, messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So the lampstands represent these seven specific congregations, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Laodicea, and Philadelphia. And the seven stars that Jesus is apparently holding in his hand 
represent the messengers of those churches. Most likely the preacher or whoever would be reading this, this letter, you know, the person delivering the message who's reading this letter to the congregation. The question is, why does Jesus describe himself as walking among them and holding them in his hand? And the answer, I believe, is that Jesus wants the church in Ephesus to understand that he knows what's going on in their church. He's with them in the midst of their struggles, their gatherings, during their worship services. You know, believers are never alone. Jesus walks among them. Uh, the number seven all throughout the book of Revelation, which is a recurring theme. We see seven churches, seven lampstands. We see seven trumpets, seven bowls, seven peals of thunder. All sorts of different things come in sevens all throughout the book. And, and the number seven throughout Revelation represents completeness or fullness. And so in that sense, these, this sampling of seven churches is intended to represent all of Christ's churches everywhere throughout all of history. And so his message to them is the same as his message to us. I walk among you. I know all the things you do. It's easy, especially I think for, for small rural churches like ours, to feel like maybe Jesus has forgotten about us out in the middle of nowhere. You know, bad things happen, or and, and we wonder, you know, if Jesus has fallen asleep at the wheel. We work hard for his kingdom and we don't see results. And so, you know, we wonder if, if he even notices us down here. But his words to them were meant to, to encourage them. And they're meant to encourage us. I walk among you. I'm there with you. I see you. Nothing happens in his church that Jesus doesn't know about. There's not a mouse in the world that he can't call by name. He sees us and He's with us. And, and when Jesus says that the stars in His hand represent the messengers of those churches, it shows that Jesus was, was holding on to those messengers with His powerful hand, protecting them in order to ensure that His message, his message was delivered. Now, Ephesus could boast some pretty stellar messengers in times gone by. Preachers who, who stood in their pulpit and preached to their people uh, the Apostle Paul was among them, Apollos, uh, Timothy, and even the Apostle John, who is the one transcribing this letter right now. Uh, and I, I certainly don't consider myself to be in the same company or class as any of those guys, but I take comfort in the fact that, that Jesus holds me in His hand too. In fact, He, he holds every single one of His children in His hand. Uh, speaking of those who belong to Him, uh, Jesus said back in John chapter 10, verse 28, I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Being held in his hand means, means being protected by him, being, being held on to. And it's not that bad things don't happen to us. Bad things do. They happen to the church in Ephesus and the Christians there as well. But, but it means, as he says here, that... that he gives us eternal life, and no one can take that away from us. No one can take us from Him. We belong to Him permanently. He's not going to let go. And so this is, is the imagery that, that Christ gives us of Himself, that He gave Ephesus, that Jesus is with His church, both in Ephesus and here in Palmyra, and he, He's holding on to us. So the next part of the letter contains the compliment for Ephesus. Jesus does pay them a compliment, and I want you to listen uh, to what he says here. He says, starting in verse 2, I have seen your hard work and your patient endurance. I know that you don't tolerate evil people. You've examined the claims of those who say they are apostles but are not, and you've discovered that they're liars. You have patiently suffered for me without quitting. And Jesus pats this church on the back essentially for two things. Their deeds and their doctrine. Uh, first, he compliments their deeds. He calls them hard workers who don't quit. They were willing to get their hands dirty. They, they understood that ministry was a part of their purpose in life. And I don't know exactly 
how all of the different members of, of the church in Ephesus were involved in ministry. You know, they were obviously sharing the gospel with people. Maybe they had an active youth ministry. Maybe they, uh, they had a food pantry or a homeless shelter or something like that that they took part in. You know, maybe they were just diligently going around door knocking house to house sharing the gospel of Jesus. Um, but whatever they did, they, they worked hard at it. And they didn't give up even when it got tough. And it got tough because this was written during days of persecution when Christians were, their lives were on the line. Many churches today, I think, are dying because they don't have enough people getting involved in doing the work of the church, the work that Christ has called us to do. But not Ephesus. They had plenty of workers and they worked hard and and we could all stand to be a little more like them in that regard. And they also understood the importance of truth. They didn't tolerate evil in their midst and they tested the claims uh, of people. So during those days, anyone could just come along and say, hey, I'm an apostle of Jesus and this is what, you know, I'm teaching. And and they didn't, they they couldn't just Google the guy and find out where he was from and, and what his background and history were or anything like that. And so they tested them. They were like, okay, well, this is what God's Word says, and this is what this guy says. If it lines up, then, then that's something. But if it didn't, well, then they knew these guys were lying. And that's what they did. Uh, I used the word doctrine earlier, and doctrine is just a, a religious-sounding word for teaching. And these, these people took the, the teachings of Christ, the teachings of the church, the teaching of, of Christianity. They took Scripture in other words, seriously. And not enough people do that anymore. You know, many of us, the Apostle Paul, um, in his letter to Timothy, and I mentioned that both Paul and Timothy actually spoke and preached at this church in Ephesus at different times. While Timothy was there at Ephesus, Paul wrote letters to him. And, uh, and in his letter, he predicted a time when people would stop concerning themselves with sound doctrine. They wouldn't care about the truth anymore. They would, they would just gather up teachers that, that told them whatever they wanted to hear. You know, and that's kind of, we, we still do that. You know, as a society, as a culture, we, we praise people and teachers who tell us what we want to hear. And, and we get angry at those who tell the truth because that's not what we like. And we don't want to be told the truth anymore. But we all need it. Truth matters. Um, all of us, as individuals and as a congregation, need to get into God's Word uh, so that we can discover God's truth. Um, You can't identify false teaching or or dangerous doctrines if you're not familiar with what the Bible really says. And I I know it can be difficult at times for, you know, to, to just make time to read the Bible. You know, we've got four kids at home. We're busy all the time. It seems like there's always a million distractions. But really, those are just excuses, right? And excuses are kind of like armpits. We, we all have a couple of them and they usually stink. <laughs> all of us, all of us need to be responsible for, for digging into God's Word and trying to understand God's truth, for making sense of His Word. Ephesus sets a good example for us today in both their deeds and their doctrine. You know, they, they were hard workers committed to expanding Christ's kingdom, and they realize the importance of knowing God's Word and and testing what other people say in light of God's Word. But for all the good things in Ephesus, Jesus had one very significant criticism for them. And you would think that a church so focused on hard work and sound doctrine would would be fully committed to the one most important command in all of Scripture. But just the opposite was true. Again, Jesus says to them in verse 4, but I have this complaint against you. You don't love me or each other as you did at first. Look how far you've fallen. Can you imagine how it must have felt to hear those words. You know, you're sitting in church in Ephesus, and I don't know who the, you know, maybe it was Timothy actually who read the letter to them. He's like, we got a letter from Jesus, guys. And he comes up to the pulpit and he starts off and it's like, man, you guys are doing great. You're doing this good. You're doing that good. But you know what? 
you don't love me. I mean, ouch. Right? Jesus made abundantly clear throughout his ministry that the most important command of all is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself. In short, love God, love people. That pretty much covers most things. And, and despite all their hard work, despite the sound doctrine that they held to, the Ephesians had missed the single most important thing of all. They lost their love for Christ and for each other. Warren Wearsby compares uh, the love that they lost to kind of like a honeymoon love. You know, a lot of couples experience this when they first get together, when they first get married. You know, they're just kind of all googly about each other. That's the best word I could think of to describe it. You know, they, they, they ooh and awe, and they, they just, they're enamored with one another. They love spending time together. When they're apart, they're constantly thinking about each other, and they're texting each other, and they're making goofy eyes at each other across the dinner table and stuff like that. I mean, it's this, this, this like just intoxicating love that they have for one another. But that doesn't last, right? Like anyone that's been married for a while knows that that, that tends to fade, after a time. And you either, you transition into a deeper, more meaningful love, or you fall out of love completely. And that's what happened for the Ephesians. That's what happens for a lot of, of believers, actually, when they first come to Christ and they experience God's love for them. They, they experience Christ's love for them. And, and they respond by loving Jesus, like, and his church passionately, and they're excited about going to church, they're excited about reading the Bible, they're excited about growing in their relationship with Jesus. And that energy, that fervor, eventually fades. The newness wears off. And many just fall out of love. Their love fades altogether. And the challenge for many churches like Ephesus. Because remember, this, was, this wasn't just to an individual or a specific individuals in the church. He's not like, hey, so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so, you don't love me. This was the whole church. You don't love me. And so the challenge to churches like Ephesus who have you know, the strong teaching and strict standards is to not lose love in light of those things. You know, they were so focused on you know, defending the faith and standing up for what they believe is right and wrong and having good moral virtue and, and working hard for Christ that they, they forgot what it was really all about. You, know, you can do all those things, and if you do them without love, you've totally missed the point. They were more concerned with winning arguments than they were with winning people. They were more concerned with, with keeping the law than, than keeping their love for Christ and for each other going. And, and law without love is just legalism. That's what the church in Ephesus had been reduced to. And it never should have happened. I mean, like I said, the, the, the teachers and preachers who had served in, in this church constantly communicated the supremacy of love. You know, Paul mentioned it in his letter to the Ephesians more than 20 times. Uh, John, uh, who is, again, transcribing this letter, he was known as the Apostle of Love, by the way, and he wrote uh, the epistle 1 John. And 1 John wasn't addressed specifically to the Ephesians. It was sent to multiple churches in the area, but Ephesus was one of them who received this letter from John. And, and in it, he, he specifically talks about love over and over. I mean, that's really the theme of the book. He says things like in 1 John chapter 3, and this is His command, that is Christ's command, to believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and to love one another as He commanded us. And then John 4, He says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. And then a few verses after that, He adds, and so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in Him. You know, could it be any clearer 
what God wanted most from the church in Ephesus or what He wants most from us. And yet, like so many Christians today, they lost that loving feeling. I'm not going to break out into song, but I, I think there's a lot of you here today that can relate. You know, maybe you've lost that loving feeling too. Fortunately, Jesus also gave a command that if followed can rekindle the flames of love in our hearts. This is the command that he gives them. Uh, so in verse 5, he tells them what to do in response. He says, so remember where you were before you fell. Change your hearts and do what you did at first. And this is just two very simple sentences, but, but it, it contains a three, three-step program to restoring their love. The first step is to remember. Ephesus used to be filled with love for God and for people. In fact, that's one of the things that attracted Paul to the church. Uh, before he ever even arrived there and, and spoke there, uh, he writes in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15, he says, Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. And he praises them because they were a loving church. This is the, the height from which they fell. And maybe, maybe you can remember a time when your love for God and for Christ was stronger or, or deeper and more fervent. The first step in rekindling your love for God and people is to remember when it burned most brightly. And the second step is to repent. Repentance means to, to realize that you've been wrong and change your heart or your mind. Uh, and Jesus even warned them, uh, saying in, in the next verse here, if you don't repent, I will come and remove your lampstand from its place among the churches. And you probably noticed in the, the video prelude to, to the sermon, it pictures these seven lampstands as, as like, kind of like a menorah, you know, a, a seven pronged lampstand, which is really what the translation should be. It's a lampstand with seven lamp places on it. So the idea is that there's seven different uh, fires burning, but they're all connected. They're all uh, attached to each other in one way or another. And, and Jesus is telling them that if you don't repent, that I'll remove your lamp from its place. Now, a church without love is not a church anymore. You know, it, its light has been extinguished. There's no reason for it to sit there. It's just taken up space. Repentance is essential to the Christian life. Admit you've been wrong. Admit that you failed to love Jesus the way you should. Seek God's forgiveness. Ask Him to restore your love. That's what He's telling them to do. And the final step is to return. Return to Jesus. He says, turn back to Me and do the works that you did at first. And it's, it's not too late to go back to Jesus and start doing things that you did when your love for Him was at its peak. And, and, and for you that... For each one of us, that's probably something different, right? I mean, we all express love. You guys have probably read like the, the five love languages and books like that. We express love and, and we receive love in different ways. And I've actually, there's like a, a version of that for Christians, the, the five love languages for, uh, of God, I think is what it's called. And it, it talks about that same thing. Like, if, if you love God, you maybe express that differently. You know, maybe when you were more passionate in your faith and, and you loved Jesus the most, you were serving and volunteering at church in different ways. Maybe you were reading your Bible all the time because you were just trying to let God speak to you. Uh, maybe, maybe you were sharing your faith with other people because, you know, acts of service, right? You're out there and you're telling other people about Jesus and you just want them to come to Jesus and know Him the way you do. Or, or maybe, you know, you were just spending quality time with Him just praying, pouring out your heart to God because you love Him so much and you just need to know that He hears you. Whatever, whatever it was for you, and, and like there's a million other things, uh, Jesus calls us to, to come back to that. You know, to turn back to Him and start doing those things that you did when you loved Him more deeply and more passionately. Remember, repent, return. That was Jesus' command to them and it still is command to us. And you know, our situation here may be very different from the situation in Ephesus 2,000 years ago. But in a lot of ways, it's, it's not all that different. 
Now, either way, I pray that we can learn a little about ourselves and our own church family as we read through these letters to the seven churches. Jesus still walks among His people. He still holds us in His hands. He still commends diligent Bible study and hard work, but He criticizes loveless hearts. And just as He did with Ephesus, He commands us to repent and to return to Him. If we'll open our ears and our hearts to what the Spirit says to the churches, then as Jesus told them, we'll be able to join with others, other victorious believers across the centuries in enjoying the fruit from the tree of life in the paradise of God. Next week, we'll open another letter from Jesus to one of these seven churches. But in the meantime, if you need help restoring lost love, if you need to fan the flames of your love for, for people or for God, then, then come talk to me. I'd like to help if I can. You can pull me aside after church. You can call me at home. My phone number's in the bulletin. Or you can just come forward now while we stand and sing together. Let's sing, church.